A lot of people have been telling me that my video on some of the lab origin myths about SARS-CoV-2 was wrong and out of date, and there were lots of milk comparisons. As always, I'm happy to issue corrections if an error is brought to my attention. So I made the same request to each of them. If you think there are errors in the video, please quote what I said in the video. Please quote what I said and explain why you think it's wrong. Only one person did find an error, which of course I immediately added to the corrections section of the video description. But all the other supposed errors were either just opinions and expressions of disapproval, a belief that the published science is wrong, a few predictable insults, one person didn't like the title, or I got no response at all. The funniest response I got is one which I think I'll have framed. Just because this clip didn't have any errors doesn't mean it's not fake news. To those who haven't seen the video, I looked at various claims that were going viral at the time, like the mysterious intern who supposedly had been infected in a Wuhan lab. That one went all the way up to a White House press briefing. An intern was infected, who later infected her boyfriend, and then went to the wet market in Wuhan, where it began to spread. When I fact-checked that, it turned out to be based on a YouTube video claiming to have found the source of the coronavirus. There was no evidence presented, except that the intern had no photo on one of the lab's website pages. That video, which got over two million hits, was also the source of other widespread myths. I showed how it had mixed up two different research institutes, and was at the end of a trail of misquotes and deliberate misrepresentations that started with a Chinese professor, Xiao Butao. My video also looked at spurious claims that the virus could have leaked because it was being held in a freezer with an alleged broken seal. I showed that a supposed secret leaked dossier was in fact just a compilation of information that was freely available on the internet. And I showed how researchers had discovered that SARS-CoV-2 has a unique and counterintuitive backbone, which is consistent with a natural origin, not bioengineering. But people seem to have mixed up the issue of a man-made virus with the possibility of a natural virus escaping from the lab. These are two different things, and here's what I said about the latter. After all, it's possible someone might have come into contact with bat samples and not noticed. According to the Washington Post, officials from the U.S. Embassy in Beijing visited the Wuhan Institute of Virology a few years ago and were concerned about safety standards there. According to the Post, the Chinese researchers at WIV were receiving assistance from the Galveston National Laboratory, but the Chinese requested additional help. The cables argued that the United States should give the Wuhan lab further support, mainly because its research on bat coronaviruses was important but also dangerous. I haven't seen anything that changes any of that. The myths are still busted. The paper I cited has gone on to be cited by over 3,000 other research papers, and the possibility of a lab leak remains. So what has happened that's caused this sudden flurry of interest? Well, firstly, a report published in the Wall Street Journal cited anonymous sources in the U.S. State Department based on the assessment of an unidentified international partner that three people had got sick at a lab in Wuhan in November 2019 and gone to hospital. Some media outlets, including the Daily Mail, of course, claimed for a fact that this was COVID-19. But the fact is, we don't know as the Wall Street Journal makes clear further down the story. Look, I know in this day and age we're all supposed to pick a side and have a definitive opinion, but I'm not saying the story isn't true. I'm not saying they didn't have COVID. I'm just saying I have no idea. So, like so much of this new information, I find it pointless to speculate, let alone reach a conclusion based on that speculation. The other thing that happened was that the U.S. president has asked the intelligence services to redouble their efforts into finding the origin of the virus after previous investigations were inconclusive. Again, all this shows is that a lab leak is possible. It tells us no more than that. What else happened? Well, there's been a WHO report into the origin of the virus but that was compromised by delays in allowing investigators into China 
and alleged obstruction by the Chinese authorities in granting full access and complete transparency. Does that mean there's a cover-up? Is this typical Chinese government secrecy? Or is it resentment of what they see as a foreign interference? Again, I have no idea. It doesn't mean a lab leak happened, or that it didn't happen, only that it's possible. So let's get on to the science, and the other hypothesis that the virus is man-made. The problem, as I explained in my video, is that researchers have found that the virus shows all the hallmarks of being natural. Not just the spike protein, which is often manipulated in gain-of-function experiments because it's the infectious part of the virus, but also the delivery system known as the backbone. So has there been anything new on that front? Well, yes, there was a hypothesis put forward by Segreto and Dagin that the virus could be man-made because the furring cleavage site in the SARS-CoV-2 virus could not have evolved naturally. As for the backbone problem, they argue that the Wuhan lab researchers could have used the backbone of an existing virus, RATG13, because that's genetically very close to SARS-CoV-2, and deliberately evolved it in the lab. The hypothesis has been laid out in two papers, but both lines of argument have been contradicted by other research. This paper shows that a similar furin cleavage site does occur in a natural virus, and another paper shows the method by which this can happen. On the second argument, a response paper to Segreto and Dagin pointed out that there's about a 4% genetic difference between RATG13 and SARS-CoV-2. That may not sound like much, but there's only a 1% difference between humans and chimpanzees. Virologists have concluded that SARS-CoV-2 and RATG13 last had a common ancestor in about 1948. The two viruses are so far apart genetically that changing one into the other would cost a huge amount of money, time and effort, if it could be done at all. It would also have been completely unnecessary, since backbones are readily available off the shelf. I'll be looking at that in more detail in my next video on popular claims by the journalist Nicholas Wade. For those reasons, the Segreto and Dagen hypothesis hasn't been widely adopted or cited, in contrast to the Nature Medicine study that's been cited over 3,000 times and is consistent with other research. The other new development was an explosive new study by Sorensen et al., a journal article set to make waves among the scientific community. I was first alerted to it by a post on my forum. More evidence mounts as we debunk the debunker. Uh, the debunker's supposed to be me, by the way. According to the poster, this explosive new study shows that the virus is man-made. But it's never a good sign when the source of your information isn't the journal itself. It's the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail says the study was about to be published in the Quarterly Review of Biophysics Discovery, QRB Discovery, which is a perfectly respectable peer-reviewed journal. And for some reason, the Daily Mail posted an embargoed copy of the paper on its website. Now, straight away, that struck me as fishy, as I mentioned to someone else who asked me about this paper. Because I often get embargoed papers sent to me, it's very common in the media, and the whole point of an embargo is that it gives a journalist time to read the paper and write up the story. But a news organisation isn't supposed to post the story until after the paper has been published. Here the Mail is not only posting a story prior to publication, it's posting a copy of the paper itself. I've never seen this happen, so it's quite bizarre. That aside, what's the evidence shown in the alleged paper? According to the Daily Mail, the authors found a fingerprint that shows the SARS-CoV-2 virus couldn't be natural because it has four positively charged amino acids in a row. It's rare to find even three in a row in naturally occurring organisms, while four in a row is extremely unlikely, the scientists said. The laws of physics mean that you cannot have four positively charged amino acids in a row. The only way you can get this is if you artificially manufacture it, Dalgleish told DailyMail.com. But this was very easy to check. 
One of the posters on my forum said it didn't take him long to find several instances of four positively charged amino acids in a row in naturally occurring viruses. I checked his sources, and I found them too. In two papers, I did a simple search for four positively charged amino acids and came up with several results. So much for this supposed law of physics. So why would a reputable peer-reviewed journal like the QRB Discovery be willing to publish such obvious twaddle? Answer? (laughs) You're ahead of me. Of course it wasn't. The Daily Mail's claim that this study was about to be published in that journal, or any journal, was nonsense. They simply took the author's word for it, without bothering to check with the journal's editor. Once it became clear a few weeks later that this imminent publication wasn't happening, the Daily Mail removed the name of the journal from the story. But the damage had already been done. Hundreds of news sites, blogs and fora had reprinted the Daily Mail claim that this was a legitimate study about to be published in the QRB Discovery, again without bothering to check. Neither did they check the spurious evidence that you can't get four positively charged amino acids in a row, which is still up there on the Mail website. You have to go a long way down the Daily Mail story, past the photos and the clickbait, to discover that virologists dismiss this unpublished claim as magical and explain that this amino acid conjunction is often found in nature. Unfortunately, that glimpse of reality is in a box relaying how Sorensen et al. have been thwarted in previous publication efforts, not because their essay is bunk, but by a conspiracy of scientists to silence them. Next, there was a claim that the lab leak theory had gained credibility because of a study by Piplani et al. I think what they mean is that the man-made virus theory had gained credibility, since the study wasn't about a lab leak, it was about how well-adapted SARS-CoV-2 is to human cells. The authors found that SARS-CoV-2 binds very tightly to human ACE2, the entry point for coronaviruses into the human body. Their conclusion is that if the virus is well adapted to human ACE2, it couldn't have jumped directly from bats to humans, so the authors looked at various candidates that might have acted as intermediate species, and although some looked promising, they couldn't find a perfect match. Which means we're back to where we started. The intermediate species still hasn't been found. We don't know where the virus came from. And that vacuum of knowledge is what's been quickly filled with speculation. So why is it very unlikely that this affinity for human ACE2 is the result of deliberate manipulation in a lab? Well, apart from the reasons already covered, researchers have found that the virus seems to have evolved in the presence of a human immune system, in other words, naturally. And the way it binds to ACE2, like so many other things in the SARS-CoV-2 virus, is a bit messy and counterintuitive, An intelligent designer wouldn't have designed it that way, but evolution frequently does. Finally, another thing that's new is that we've had the email from a senior researcher at the Scripps Institute saying that one really small part of the genome looks potentially engineered, but a team of researchers is going to look at it critically, and further analysis needs to be done, and they should know more by the end of the weekend. And it turned out that when they did look at it more critically they discovered that the virus bore all the hallmarks of being natural. At least that's what the team, researchers from five different universities and scientific institutes from three different countries, concluded in Nature Medicine. So, does this mean that the researchers' initial impression had to be correct and that any change must therefore be the result of corruption and dishonesty? Or does it mean that initial impressions in science are often overturned as research continues and more evidence is found? I can't claim to know the answer to that one either, so feel free to speculate on your own. All I can tell you is that I've been reporting on scientific research for over three decades and I don't find such changes at all surprising. In fact, I've reported this on my channel before, when a rather crude estimate of past temperatures was improved as better data became available. That update led to howls of protest because the latest information didn't fit what a lot of people wanted to believe. The bottom line is that there are a lot of questions that we still don't have answers to, 
and I wish I could make something up for you, like so many others are doing. In fact, a lot of the theories that are coming out of this speculation are simply throwing up more questions that don't have answers. All I can do is check some of the claims that are bouncing around the internet and weed out the ones that are bullcrap. I hope that helps. Asking lots of questions and then speculating and offering opinion is fine, if you enjoy that kind of thing, but I'd rather not join the pack. Of course, we do need to know where the virus came from, but a definitive answer will only come from solid evidence, not misquotes, changed documents, fake dossiers, exaggerations, fabrications, misrepresentations and magical facts dreamed up in published papers that don't exist. It won't come from circumstantial evidence, suspicions, guesswork or possibilities either, unless and until the questions thrown up by this speculation are themselves answered. But of course that's not going to stop people pointlessly speculating. These pundits always love to put quotes alongside their speculation to give it some kind of intellectual legitimacy. So I'm going to leave you with the wise words of that much-overlooked philosopher and 20th century intellectual giant, Ryan O'Neill, who said this, Anything is possible, but possible don't make it true.